the Travel Squad podcast. We're four friends that grew up together in the same small town. We followed each other to San Diego, and now we adventure the world together. One passport stamp at a time. We're here to share our travel stories and inspire you to go on your own adventures. Even if it starts with your own backyard. I'm Jamal. Brittany. Kim. And I'm Dana. And And we're we're the the Travel Travel Squad Squad podcast. podcast. So grab your ticket, your passport, and don't forget your travel insurance. And prepare for takeoff. Hello. Hey, Hey. everybody. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 17 of the Travel Squad podcast. Today, we're going to talk about what I do best, how to plan a trip, and money saving techniques during the planning process. Planning a trip is one of the most exciting parts of a trip other than going on it, and it's literally something I live for. There's a lot of research that goes into it, though, and you have to do all that research because you want to make sure you get to see and do everything that you want to do, especially because for our trips, we only have a short amount of time and we have to jam pack everything in there, even if you're sick and struggling with a cold like I am today. So if you hear me cough or anything, just, you know, don't mind me. (laughs) (laughs) Exciting information, guys. We are actually going through the trip planning process right now because we're planning our trip to Lebanon and Dubai in January 2020. So we thought this is going to be the perfect episode because we're documenting what we do to bring it to you so you can be a trip planning money saving ninja. Ooh, ninja. So in this episode, we're going to take you through the planning process step by step as we do it ourselves to hopefully give you guys tips and advice on how to plan accordingly and how to save money doing it. So what is the first step to plan a trip? Most important is pick where you're going. Pick a destination. Yeah, I guess you'll probably need that. (laughs) (laughs) Can't have a trip without a place to go. So how we pick our destinations, there's many different ways, but we all have our own bucket lists. And I mean, everyone has a bucket list. You see a waterfall on Instagram or your friend tells you about this hike they did in New Zealand or whatever it is, you know you have your own list in the back of your mind. I feel like between the four of us, we all start throwing out ideas and whatever we ooh and ah at the most is typically what we do next. I think I DM you guys on Instagram like random pictures I see all the time. Like, let's go here. Let's go here. <laughs> sometimes I just ignore those because they're just outrageous. Hey, okay. hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, <laughs> I'm kidding. And sometimes we ooh and ah at prices instead of locations. That's, That's true. true. As a matter of fact, we're talking about how we're going through the major trip planning process now for Lebanon and Dubai, January of 2020. But we are about to be going to Chicago. And Chicago was picked as a destination simply for or the fact that Southwest had a sale. So sometimes picking the destination, we do so keeping in mind what sales are going on by certain airlines. And Chicago is one of those trips that we're just taking. Not a bucket list place to go, but it's not not a place we don't want to go. Isn't yeah, right? it has been on our list for a while now. And then these sales pop up. And there's lots of places that you can find sales besides just your standard usual airlines like Southwest. A couple of good websites that you should be aware of. Scott's Cheap Flights is a big one that always puts out sales that you can jump on real quick and save hundreds of dollars for international flights. Um, You can also check out Fair Deal Alert and The Flight Deal. They're two really good ones that have international and domestic flight sales all the time. Isn't that what you used when you had your stopover in Copenhagen? Um, No, actually I used Skyscanner for that. And I was trying to figure out the cheapest way to get back from Venice after Easter weekend. And as I was looking on Skyscanner, I found there was a route through Copenhagen. So I ended up booking two different flights that went through Copenhagen and saved like 200 bucks. Very nice. And you got like 12 hours in Copenhagen too. Fucking them hard. And fucking them hard. (laughs) And got yourself a mini vacation within your other vacation. Yes. Yeah. Another good website is viama.com. I like that one. Oh, I remember Viama. Yeah. That's right. I also want to reiterate that this step-by-step process is good for both weekend trips and international trips. So no matter how long your flight is, this works for any trip. Step two, pick your travel dates. 
This one's definitely important, and I feel it also correlates with the pick your destination, because sometimes we want to go a lot of places, but there's certain times of the year where it's a popular place, and that's the tourist season for it, and it's going to be more expensive. So if you can, picking the travel dates around non-peak season times will definitely save you money in terms of airfare, less crowds, but I think that picking your destination and your travel dates definitely go hand in hand. Yeah, it's kind of like chicken or the egg. Which one do you do first? And you could do either one first, depending on what you find. The most important thing about picking your travel dates other than when you can actually go, if you are flexible, depending on the place that you're gonna go, know the weather at the time that you're planning to go. So to tie this back to our trip planning process, now for January 2020, which again is Lebanon and Dubai. Lebanon during the summer is very, very humid. And that's some place that we definitely want to avoid because of the humidity. It's I don't want to say it's going to ruin the trip, but it's definitely going to make it not as fun. Where in January, the weather is definitely not humid. There will be occasional rain, but it's definitely going to be a lot cooler as it's along the Mediterranean coast. And then Dubai, we know it's in the middle of the desert. So during certain times of the year pretty much Hot probably and yeah <laughs> pretty much any time probably from like april to september you, it's going to be in the high hundreds where in january it's 75 degrees so we pick the right time for lebanon and dubai based on weather when we're going to be there and we're not saying don't go during a busy season sometimes it's nice to go at the start of a busy season or at the end so you don't hit the most amount of tourists it's not completely packed and you are able to enjoy the city with a little bit more space and wiggle room because when we were in croatia for example we went to the plitvica national parks and we were told we were there at the end of the season and we thought it was busy but they said like a week or two prior they had triple the amount of people there and we just couldn't imagine what that would be like that's so funny because when i was in split croatia it was in April and I had the entire hostel to myself like legit it was closed down and someone had to come open it up for me and that's the downside of going on the off season is things can be closed down and not as open as they would be during a busy season so you just find your balance between price and fun and then the last tip for picking your dates is you can use tools like Google Flights and Skyscanner to kind of look at a month view and it will tell you how the price changes day to day for certain flights that you're looking for and if you're flexible, then you can pick a Wednesday or Thursday or Friday or whatever works best for your price and your schedule. One last thing about traveling and the weather. So in 2011, my mom took us to the Philippines as a graduation gift to me. And she doesn't like to go in June. She usually likes to go like in February, March. And she's like, you know, it's not the best time to go. And we're like, whatever, let's go anyways. So we book the trip, we go. We went during typhoon season and one of our flights... <laughs> We flew back to Manila, which is the capital from a small island, and we flew through a typhoon and we could feel our plane hit an air pocket and us drop in the air. Oh my God. <laughs> Zena would have been crying. Pretty crazy. That's the only time I've really been on a plane and legitimately thought like, oh, wow, I could probably die right now because everybody on it screen. Yikes. But nonetheless, even if you're not going anywhere as extreme as the Philippines, just keep in mind something as simple as a cruise. Are you going to go make a cruise sometime in the month of August when we know is hurricane season, things like that? So definitely be mindful of the weather patterns of your destination during that time of year that you're trying to go. So step three, after you've picked your destination, and pick your travel dates, it's important to determine the length of your trip and how long you want to be there. So Brittany and I probably do this best by looking at what we want to do. So this is where the intense research begins. Yeah, we just start jotting down all of the things that we know we have to see and we start to use that to help determine how many days we need in each place that we're going to go to so that we can help build our trip in general. Yeah. And obviously, you need to make sure how many days can you actually take. Yeah, that whole vacation. work thing, I guess, comes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Not that, for you, Kim. <laughs> well, that's true. But if you have at least two weeks of PTO and going somewhere, most people don't really take more than that time off. And they would think, oh, I have all this time off. Let me take two weeks. But depending on where you're going, you might not even need that long. So that's why actually doing the research, trying to find out, okay, these activities or sites are in this location. How long is it going to take me to see it? Because then you're saving extra days on hotels. Maybe you could come back midweek if you don't need to spend much more time and you have a cheaper flight that way. So determining the length of the trip based on what it is 
is you actually plan to do and creating an itinerary definitely goes a long way. Yeah, the biggest bummer would be to book your trip and then realize if you just had one more day, you could have done this epic thing. But you didn't plan right. (laughs) Or get done with everything that you wanted to do and then be sitting there spending two extra days Mm -hmm. twiddling your thumbs because like, oh, I've already done it. Yeah, good point. Another thing that you can do when you pre-plan and plan what you're going to do, we mentioned it earlier, but you can add in a stopover onto your trip. If it's cheaper, if it's easy, if you have the time, if it saves you money, you can add in a long layover stopover into another destination and make that work for your trip too. Yeah, Brittany and I had actually just done this on our last trip that we went on when we did our gate one tour along the Adriatic coast. So we ended in Slovenia. However, our tour was flying us out of Venice and on a Saturday morning, on a Saturday morning. So we, yeah. So we (laughs) said to ourselves, okay, well, if they're flying us out on a Saturday and we're already in Venice, I don't want to fly out on a Saturday. I'll just spend the day on my own and fly out Sunday. And obviously with the time difference, when we fly out on Sunday, we still arrive on a Sunday so we can make it to work on Monday. So We didn't have to pay any extra to do that because through our tour, our flights were included. So we just told them instead of flying a Saturday, fly a Sunday, and it was part of a package. And we squeezed in an extra day. But definitely you're in that part of the world and squeeze it out and see it. And believe me, you don't need more than one day in Venice. After I did my research on it, definitely Mm realized that you don't need more than one day in Venice, in my personal opinion. And speaking of like when you're in that part of the world, taking advantage of it, tying this back to Lebanon and Dubai, we all knew we wanted to go to Lebanon. Lebanon. 2020. Yeah. And kept saying Lebanon 2020. <laughs> and we're like, well, we're in that part of the world. Why don't we go to Dubai for a few days? Might as well. <laughs> Absolutely. And how much were the flights from Lebanon to Dubai? $100. $100. $99. Yes, $100. <laughs> Save not, that $1. <laughs> yeah. So not bad at all. So, you know, if you're in that part of the world or somewhere close and you want to do somewhere else, definitely look into it and see if you can shorten your length at your original place that you want to be and put in a day or two somewhere else that's close by. So step four, determine who you're going to travel with. I don't really like traveling with you guys anymore. I've come to that conclusion. The squad's breaking up. (laughs) (laughs) This is the last episode ever. Yeah. (laughs) No, it's not. (laughs) (laughs) We're actually going to Chicago this weekend. (laughs) But yeah, determine who you're traveling with and just know, and I know that we've said this on other episodes, just because someone is your best friend doesn't mean that they're going to be your best travel companion. Keep that awareness that you just never know who you're going to to jive with when you're traveling. And yeah, for example, if you want to hike, but you're going with someone that doesn't like the outdoors, it might not be a good pairing. Or if you are more open-minded and you have someone more closed-minded, yeah. Or if you like to wake up super early at the crack of dawn. And, mm-hmm. and for us, you know, traveling as a squad, one of the things that we do is we definitely share hotel rooms, again, at least on the shorter weekend getaways, share rental cars. So that definitely does save on cost too. So if you can travel as a group and you're comfortable with that after you've determined, okay, I think these people are conducive and we could all mesh very well when we travel, you could save a lot of money that way by going with a group of people. But sometimes you like to be the independent traveler as Zena was when she was younger. And one of the things that she liked to do to save money traveling alone was couch surf. I did. Yeah. I don't I know. I can't believe it's... you did that. Well, tell us what couch surfing is, Zena, for people who don't know. I don't even know if it's still a thing anymore. It is. It is. It is. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. So couch surfing is a website. And instead of staying, because this is days before Airbnb came about. So you go onto couchsurfing.com and people offer up rooms or their couch, hence couch surfing for you to crash on for free. I was in Denmark once and I met up with someone via that website. He was Danish from Copenhagen. Hagen and he showed me around the city. I stayed with someone in Rome and we had a bottle of wine just chilling, but it was a free place to stay. I don't know. Like I've met a lot of people through couch surfing. It's cool. It's free. You just got to be open-minded. And so you're not traveling with somebody, but you're sharing your experience with a local to an extent. And you, I remember you telling me a lot of them gave you good tips and advice of what to do in the city, where to go to legitimately eat. So if you're traveling with a group of people, you can't do it. But if you're the independent traveler and don't want a hostel, that's a good thing to do is do the couch surfing. Exactly. Did you ever you know? feel unsafe? I always felt safe. It was always a really good time for me. So I appreciate the experiences that I've had. So yeah, I encourage it. 
under the topic of determine who you're traveling with, I'm always bouncing around in my mind, like, should this trip be with just Jamal? Should this trip be with the squad? Should we add family to the trip? So I'm constantly trying to like make a balance of who I'm traveling with. Yeah, because as much as I love traveling with the squad, Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I was joking (laughs) when I said that earlier, Kim. I would hope you would know that. (laughs) I just can't imagine why you would ever want to go on a trip without me. I'm so We have so much fun. (laughs) Well, sometimes I enjoy spending time with my wife alone. I hate to say that, but that's reality. You guys guys have a great day. (laughs) (laughs) But vacation is a little bit different. But no, I I agree with Brittany's sentiment on that. But nonetheless, after you determine who you're going to be traveling with, the next step, step five, is plan a rough draft of your daily itinerary itinerary and how to get around this part i love this part yeah me too and i just want to say before we go too far into step five i want to say how it connects to step three which is determine the length of your trip so when you do your rough draft this is where you see okay this is what i want to do this is how far everything is Mm -hmm. and you can more plan accordingly too on the amount of time and just double check and make sure that what you chose for your time is correct or if you need more or less yeah we have that list of things we want to do and then you have to figure out how to get to those things. So on domestic trips, we do rent a car often, but on international trips, hardly ever or never. So you have to figure out public transportation, what the times it is that they come, how long it's going to take you to get there to figure out what you can even accomplish in a single day. Yes, I actually have a pro tip for this portion. Ooh, please tell us. Yeah, so (laughs) for example, for Japan, I went on to a travel website that does the guided tours and I pulled their highlights. Ooh, and Yeah. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I pulled their highlights. And so I figured when you go on those guided tours, they take you to the must-sees, the highlights of the city. So I just made a list of all of those and just checked into them myself. And the hotels too. Yes, and so that helped me plan my daily itinerary a lot better. Nice. And one thing that I just want to say is that if you are going with a group or even, you know, just one other person, make sure that you're throwing your ideas out there and they are throwing their ideas out there. And if you say that you don't care and you let the other person plan it, or they say they don't care and they want you to plan it, that's cool. But you're also giving up your right to complain (laughs) because if you aren't willing to do the work, then I don't think that you have a right to complain about it you know take responsibility when we went to japan again i put out a google document saying like hey what do you guys want to do at each of the cities and really not many people commented back our friend kasha that went with us to japan she said i know for sure we want to go to mount fuji one day but that's like all we really want to do so anything else you do we're cool with which was great because then i just planned everything but i was open to suggestions so anyone can put them in yeah tying it back to the mount fuji thing that goes into again seeing what it is that you want want to do. So Mount Fuji is closest to Tokyo in terms of major cities. So if you're going to Japan, you're obviously going to be in Tokyo. But if you really look into it, you will realize that that is a complete full day trip to go to Mount Fuji from Tokyo. So whatever time you thought you would need in Tokyo to just see the highlights of Tokyo, we knew we had to say, okay, we need one more day because Mount Fuji is going to take a full day. Whereas you don't want to just get there and say, oh, I want to go to Mount Fuji and then do it and then realize, okay, I have less time now in Tokyo to do the other stuff and you're bound by flights or train tickets. Yeah, I like to also look at how much things cost, the entrance fees, the train tickets, anything that has a cost associated with it. So I kind of know how much I'm planning to budget for transportation food, drinks, hotels, whatever else. And then by the end of my itinerary, it's like a fully built out fucking travel agent shit over here. And it's amazing. So I know that when we were in London, for example, London has a really great metro system. The tube. The tube. The tube. (laughs) And Jamal pre-purchased a card called the Oyster Card. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the Oyster Card, Jamal? Oh, well, sure. The Oyster Card is basically a card that you can get as a tourist. And I had ordered it before we left which we do for a lot of things before we go if we're going to have entrance tickets like i believe kim was saying you know she'll tally up the totals of what things are going to cost but anything that we can buy beforehand we definitely do so we did that with the oyster card and you basically pay a preloaded amount onto the card and it's good for your metro or tube fares or subway whatever you want to call it but the good news about it is when you use that card whatever the normal fare is you won't pay that 
price, it's actually going to be cheaper. And if you hit a certain cost in the day that you use, it will actually cap you. So all your future rides for the rest of the day are free. Fucking them hard. Fucking them hard. <laughs> it came in clutch. When yeah. So that's definitely something to take into consideration too on when you're planning and figuring out your transportation. And that's a definitely good way to save money because if we actually paid out of pocket, one, we wouldn't have been capped. Two, we would have been paying full price. So the Oyster card was good. And what was really great about that was I ended up going to London a little bit less than six months after you guys. And so I just took your guys's Oyster card. So I didn't have to order it online. And I just had to fill it with my own money to ride the system. So if you know someone who's been to some place before you, maybe you can borrow their stuff. Yeah. Well, that's also, that's just a really good point in general of if you know someone that's been somewhere, ask them for all of the details. What'd you do? What was worth it? How did you get around? You can do all the research online, but hearing it from someone that's done it is the most valuable. And circling step five back around to our planning of Lebanon and Dubai, you know, step five here, we're talking about plan a rough draft or your daily itinerary and how to get around. So we do know in Lebanon, they don't really have any sort of mass transportation system. They have buses, but I wouldn't say they're necessarily even reliable uh, in terms of where they specifically go. They go to general areas, but not necessarily set stops. You want to know what it's like? You go to a big station and then they have these buses where it fits maybe like eight people. It's kind of like a van and you tell them where you want to go and then they throw you in the car that is going to be going in that general direction. And then the first person who says where they want to go, that's where they designate that that car is going to be going to that area. So really chaotic as you can see. So (laughs) you you definitely don't want (laughs) to travel with that situation. So we know some things that we are definitely going to plan to do in Lebanon, which is go to one of their mountainous cave systems where they have stalagmites, stalactites. They have a place called Harissa, which is almost, I want to say, their version of Christ the Redeemer that you see in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, except it's not Christ, it's the Virgin Mary, big nice statue on a mountain. And we do want to go to this one particular waterfall that's really, really scenic. And since they don't have good mass transportation, we are going to be hiring a driver for the day. So since they're all close, we could start north and work our way to south back down. We're going to do that all in one day to jam pack it since Lebanon is a small country. And on top of that, that gives us more days to do other things. And two, now we don't have to hire a driver each and every day, which will cost more than just hiring a driver one time. You guys, it's going to be so fun. Yes, it is. And when I plan my daily itineraries, I usually plan either like north to south or east to west. For example, when we went to Kyoto, we wanted to go to the bamboo forest and the bamboo forest is on the outskirts of town. And so we figured, why don't we start our day there? And while I was researching that area, I actually found out there was a monkey park there. So we squeezed that in too. Mm -hmm. And from there, we started to head back into the main city. So when you're planning out your day, think about time frames, think about what locations where things are so you can get the most out of your day as well. Because in Kyoto, they only had a bus system. Well, they did have a, a two line metro, but it wasn't very effective. So you have to think like, how long is it going to take me to travel on bus all day between destinations and whatnot? Versus in Tokyo, they have a amazing metro system. So no matter where you go, you can get there very, very quickly and you don't have to worry about time frames so much. And in Tokyo, they had a three day metro pass. So anytime you go, to a new area, find out to see if they have deals for tourists because sometimes they have 24-hour bus pass or metro pass at a discounted rate that you can get. So mom and dad, have you looked up the rail system in Chicago? Partially. (laughs) (laughs) You still have a couple days. Partially, yes. We have looked it up, but we haven't done it extensively for basically one reason in particular. Where we're staying is pretty close to downtown, not necessarily walkable, but we only need to take one line into downtown from where we're going to be going. And that's pretty much the cluster of where we're going to be staying. And then on top of that, we are going to be going to Indiana Dunes National Park. So we're going to rent a car one day and drive. So I don't think we're going to be using the metro as much. And that's why we haven't really looked into Chicago too much in terms of their system or anything. But I've been looking into Dubai, as a matter of fact, seeing where their metro system goes from the airport. And we're talking about staying at Atlantis, the Palm out there. Where do you mean talking about staying there? Well, we are staying there. Let's put 
but the, I've seen talking about because two people, I won't say who, <laughs> <laughs> haven't booked their hotel yet. Who could even, that be? Yeah, even <laughs> though Brittany and I have. But that's what I mean by that. But nonetheless, the metro doesn't go out to the Palm. They have a monorail. So I've already started to kind of look into that, figure out, is it worth it to take the mass transit, the taxis, doing the research to figure out cost of taxis. One tip that I've learned, they have Uber out there in Dubai, but Uber's more expensive than the taxis. Can you believe that? Wow, so not even going to bother to take an Uber. That's a good tip, Jamal. Yeah. Another thing too is, although Jamal was saying purchase in advance because it might be cheaper, there are some things where it might not necessarily be cheaper to book in advance, but it's worth it to book it in advance. Like Disneyland tickets for Shanghai Disney or when we went to Tokyo Disney. It's chaotic to have to buy tickets the morning of. And so you're going to pay the exact same price online and it's just worth it to save the time. Yeah, I agree. Like for example, when Brittany and I were in Paris and we bought our Louvre tickets or tickets to the Eiffel Tower, we already had our set time that we were going to go pick up the tickets to go to the Louvre, go to the top of the Eiffel Tower. But one other thing I want to circle back around is I know Brittany mentioned the Oyster card, which I then talked about. She mentioned the three-day Metro Pass in Tokyo. But a lot of places, again, most recently we did Japan. They have their JR Rail Pass, which one, you actually do have to book in advance, but it saves you money on the travel because it's a flat rate for unlimited use of their train system. Same situation for Europe. They have the Euro Rail. So when we went to Europe, if you're going to be going from country to country and not flying, you can get those in advance. They're more geared for tourists. They're cheaper than if you, one, were to buy them there, and you can get them for a flat cost, unlimited use. The one thing that I found in Europe, I booked the Coliseum ahead of time. It was great to have up my own time, but there was a service fee online. And then we did not book the Vatican ahead of time. And then we were in line to buy it and someone gave us free tickets. Oh, you got lucky. That's nice. So you could gamble and it could work (laughs) out. (laughs) It worked out for you on that one though, yeah? So step six, book lodging based on the area that's most accessible to get around. Or has the coolest vibe. (laughs) That's That's important. That's such a Kim thing to say, but I say that with love. (laughs) Like when we went to Tokyo, we were outskirts of Tokyo, but we were right next to a metro line. And so why pay more to be more in the city when we're right there? Uh, Yeah. uh, Why we picked that specific area in Tokyo? The reason why was because it was really close and had a direct bus line to Tokyo Disneyland. Ooh, priorities. And we did go to Tokyo Disneyland. But beyond that, Zaina was right originally when she said it was on the outskirts of Tokyo, so not as expensive as being Tokyo Center. But we didn't need it for two reasons. One, again, we were going to Tokyo Disney, had the direct bus line that was right there. And on top of that, we were by a metro line. Even though we were on the outskirts, that was the main metro line. It was. So we could catch any transfer to any other line from there. So substantially cheaper to be on the outskirts and it didn't really matter being close to the city because of how cheap it was going to be in terms of travel cost on the metro since we had that three-day unlimited pass. When I took my recent trip to Rome, we were trying to figure out what neighborhood to stay in and there were some central popular neighborhoods close by the Colosseum and everything else, but they were more expensive by a few hundred dollars for lodging. So we figured out hotel versus Airbnb. Airbnb was going to be our cheapest place. We figured out the Termini Station neighborhood was actually much, much cheaper and more central for backpackers. Anytime you find a neighborhood for backpackers, it's always going to be cheaper. So we kind of looked at the map to see how long it would take to walk to where we're going. 30-ish minutes, not a big deal. You get to see the city while you're walking too. It's also close to a train station if you're going to be going in and out of different cities and you save money on lodging. So for all of those reasons, that's the neighborhood that we chose rather than splurging on a more central location and wasting hundreds of dollars. Yeah, we had a similar experience when we went to Amsterdam. Jamal and I actually stayed in the outskirts and it was about a two mile walk into the city, about 30 minutes. And we just said, okay, you know what? We're going to walk the city every single day instead of staying in downtown because it was so much cheaper to stay on the outskirts. And you get the added benefit of steps that offsets all of the, what's the word I'm looking for? All the food we indulged in? (laughs) Indulging, yes. Yeah. But no, really, 
really worked well for Amsterdam because one, it's a walkable city. It's a city made to be walked in or biked in. They love their bikes in the Netherlands, but nonetheless, we did walk it. And in Amsterdam, just as well, staying on the outskirts saves you a lot of money. And by a lot, I mean, it was at least half the price, maybe even a little bit more off than that if we were going to stay any closer. But they don't really have a metro. They have a above ground light rail, but that's a lot closer to the central rings of downtown. So we didn't even really have access to that. But nonetheless, saved a lot of money, walked the city. It's an experience in and of itself. And then as you're also trying to figure out where to stay, like I said before, look into your options for lodging. There's hostels, there's hotels, there's Airbnb. Couch surfing. Mm -hmm. And depending on the destination you're going to, maybe more equipped for one or the other. For example, Dubai, we're not going to stay in an Airbnb. We're going to stay in a resort. Whereas, like I said, for Italy, we stayed in Airbnbs the whole time. So let's just see what's out there and see what's best for you. Another thing to keep in mind too is if you have family in the area, be open to staying with them for a few days. It will save on hotel costs. You don't have to stay with them for the entire amount of time, of course, if you can't stand to stay with them for the entire amount of time. We all love our families. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you know, it's an option to see them and have time with them and experience life like they would in that city, but also save money while you're doing we'll it. We'll be staying with your sister in Dallas coming yes. up pretty soon, actually. We are. We're staying two nights with my sister and one night in Arkansas on our trip to Hot Springs National Park. And when we're in Lebanon, we're actually staying with Jamal and Zena's cousin. Well, he gave us his flat to stay in while we're there. Preemptive shout out. Thanks, Waleed. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Waleed. Thank you. <laughs> and then another tip, too, is if you're going someplace, if you know anyone there, it doesn't even have to be family. Maybe you went to high school with this person and you just briefly <laughs> know them no but seriously you know reach out and just let them know that hey i'm gonna be in the area it'd be cool to meet up with you is there anything that you can recommend because people want to help you out and you never know what's going to happen i've got a lot of crazy stories about that but this isn't the time and place any last thoughts on step six, ladies? Nope. We got our lodging book. Let's move on. Step seven. Book the extras. What are the extras? One, rental car. Two, museums, attractions. Three, Viator. That tours, will, excursions, yeah, activities. Viator was my definite go-to for tours and activities in other cities. I found that to be pretty solid across the globe. Yeah, I love it. I'm looking at some for Lebanon to go out to Baalbek because Wonderful. that's pretty far out there. And, you know, I don't want to rent a car. I'd rather much go to that place on a guided tour and actually get the historical lecture. And if the free you will. lunch that comes with it. Yeah. <laughs> going back to the book extras, rental car, depending on where you're going, you might not need it, especially if you're in a city like London, Paris, Tokyo, New York, where they have a good subway, metro system, mass transportation, you're definitely not going to need it. But any place here in the United States, more often than not, you're going to need a rental car. So we definitely do that. And I just want to circle back around to a tip that we had given in one of our other episodes, episode four, which was how to travel more often. We gave a little tip about when we rent cars, when it becomes a week before our travel date, we'll re look at the prices and definitely a lot of times we'll find it cheaper and after we had had that episode air one of our listeners actually told us wow I actually saved 50 bucks by doing that so that's something nice. that we still do to this day is look at the rental cars so we're going to be coming to Chicago here pretty soon believe me tonight or tomorrow we're going to relook to make sure the rental car is not cheaper and save some more money that way are we renting the car in Chicago yeah yeah to get to Indiana Sand Dunes National Park because it's in Indiana we have talked about this several Several times. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> you know what I discovered through my research? That we're going to Indiana? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. I did. But also, it's called Indiana Dunes National Park, not Indiana Sand Dunes. Oh, thank you for correcting thank me. I keep saying sand dunes because they are sand dunes on Lake Michigan. Hey, pop but. quiz, guys. Anyone but Jamal. What's the capital of Indiana? Indianapolis. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> so hard of a question. I didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. What's the capital of Illinois? Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not good with my capsule. Springfield. Springfield. Yeah. <laughs> so as Zena was saying earlier, you can book a lot of tickets online and it may not be cheaper in price, but it does give you the convenience of not having to wait in the line to buy the ticket. Time is money. 
Time is money. I remember going to the Louvre and there was a huge line just to get the tickets and then another line to enter the museum. And we had a special entrance because we had purchased our ticket online. Or how about when we were in Japan at Disneyland and we already had our tickets and Cash and Ryan had to go buy theirs. And so we went ahead and they had to plan on catching up with us. Ooh, Kasha, if you're listening, take this tip. We love you, girl. (laughs) (laughs) Buy those tickets in advance. (laughs) Same thing happened in China, too. They bought their tickets in line there. But we saved their spot in line for them. We did. That's what travel buddies are for. Yeah. Yeah. But like I said earlier, and Brittany just mentioned, we did it when we bought tickets to the Louvre, Eiffel Tower, Disneyland, as we're talking about. But anything that you want to do, if it has an entrance fee, see if you can buy the ticket online doesn't matter what it is kim said time is money save yourself time and if you plan your trip far enough in advance yes it's still an expense of the trip but you're not spending that money all at once so it definitely makes the trip feel and seem more affordable that way And some tours do sell out in advance. So if you're waiting till the last minute, there's a chance that a tour or an attraction can sell out and you're not able to do it if you don't buy it in advance. Yeah, I remember my supervisor, she went to Antelope Canyon and on the way there, she texted me if she needs to get tickets in advance. And I was like, book online, girl, book online. And so her and her family were separated because it was sold out. Yeah, Yeah. Mm, that's a bummer. So one other tip too, if you're traveling with a group, have one person buy tickets for your attraction attraction so that you guys can stick together because sometimes tours do sell out and you are separated. If you book together as a group, you're more likely to be put together. More likely to be put together and depending on how many people in your group, you may get a mass discount because they do do group discounts. Not that I don't think we ever get any for four or more, but... (laughs) So we're now accepting applications to grow the squad Yeah, (laughs) for that discount. (laughs) No, but again, our upcoming trip that we keep talking about to Chicago, we did that that for our riverboat tour or the architecture tour throughout downtown because they have two tours at the same time leaving from different docks. So we said to ourselves, wow, if Brittany and I buy our tickets together and Kim and Zaina buy theirs separately, who's to say we're going to be on the same boat because they could be buying for the same time, but be put on the different boat. I truly bought it for the four of us because I don't trust Zaina and Kim to go online whoa, and, buy whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> and buy their own tickets. They're going to be like texting me separately. Which dock did you guys say? <laughs> what time are we going at? Whoa, 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 whoa. I concur. <laughs> <laughs> There's also rooftop bars that you have to think about in every city you go to. Everyone or just you? I mean, I'll do that. That's my part in this squad. I own that. Okay. And I, and I got you guys' back. I know, I'm glad you do because you know what? I always enjoy the experience when we hit up a rooftop bar. If Kim wasn't here to pressure me to be a rooftop bar person, I wouldn't be a rooftop bar person. But I am because Kim loves it and she's part of the squad. As long as they have Moscow mules mm. and pina coladas and I'm of a big fan do. of fireball shots. Whoa. And- Ew. <laughs> really? Oh my Pretty God. soon she's going to say, give me the Jaeger. Oh, God. <laughs> oh my God. I remember when I used to down those Jaegers. Just give me an old fashioned. I'll be happy. It's classy at a rooftop top bar. You want to be classy at a rooftop bar, Zaina. Kim, what is Moscow your mules. favorite Kim, what is your favorite rooftop bar that you've ever been to? Ooh, good question. Hmm. Stumped me here. I dun, love them dun, all dun. so We're much. With the suspense. But I would probably say the Americana building in Mexico City because it was cheap and I love that. And the view, the 360 view and the view from the bathroom was just so good. You know, it was really fun, but I vaguely remember this was on St. Patty's Day when we were in Cuba and we were at the club with the cannons and they mm-hmm. had a roof and they didn't have a bar on there, but they had a roof. And I remember going to the top and taking pictures. We had drinks on the roof though. We did. And it was <laughs> <laughs> really, like I said, it's vaguely, vaguely in my mind, but it was a good time. We are planning to hit up two rooftop bars in Chicago at a minimum. Minimum two per city. Chicago, <laughs> look out. <laughs> We're coming. So once you have all of your activities and tickets booked, then you have to start saving. And that is next step. Step eight. Save. And it's our last step. Oh, our last step. So I mentioned before, I like to kind of note how much things are going to cost. If I haven't pre-purchased them, things like transportation activities, even food, I like to estimate Okay, a drink's about $5. I'm probably going to have about 20 a day. So that comes out. 
got $100 in drinks. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Maybe. But yeah, so then I have an estimate. I know about how much I should bring to kind of figure how much I should budget for, plan for, and not have any surprises at the end of the trip. Kim, if you were looking to do 20 drinks a day, you should have gone to Africa, man. Wouldn't be spending more God than 20 damn it. <laughs> Africa. <laughs> I'll never live that down. I think I mentioned this in a previous episode, probably episode four, how to travel more often. I do budget for travel. So there is a set amount of money that I put in a travel bank account each month. And so usually I know how much I'm going to be pulling from that at each trip and kind of have a rough estimate. But I do think what you said, Kim, that noting cost of things, that's a really great tip. And then paying for things in advance so that it's not coming all out at once. Oh yeah, I love that. So we already bugged Lebanon and Dubai, which is a big chunk of change. When that trip finally comes up in January, it'll be like, we haven't spent anything, so... It's already paid for. Yeah, I love that. So that's another good tip to book in advance. Yes, book in advance. Get things out of the way. You might focus on your flights first. Then next month that you have a little extra change, book your hotels. The month after that, you know, if you're planning far in advance, book your extras. It's a good way to plan things out and help spread the cost around. Cool. And then a few last tips about planning and saving money. We already mentioned that you can look at rental car prices and just keep on going through your planning process. It can seem like a lot of work up front, but then you start ticking away at it and you get more and more excited as the trip comes up and boom, 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 you're there and you're having fun. Four (laughs) words for you guys. Keep on keeping on. (laughs) (laughs) On the note of rental cars and whatnot, also relook at hotel prices. If you happen to book a refundable hotel room, it never hurts to go back online and relook at prices, see if there's anything cheaper. If prices drop, sometimes with Expedia, I'll get an email saying prices dropped in an area. So I'll I'll go back and rebook. Well, on top of that, speaking about hotel prices, one thing that Brittany and I do, and I know Zaina does, Kim, do you use Ebates? I do. I love yeah. it. Yeah. So if any of you guys are unfamiliar with what Ebates is, it's basically a website where you almost use it as your shopping platform. So if you want to shop through Expedia, Macy's, other Sephora. Sephora, other big name retailers, if you will, or even again, travel companies, because we're talking in Expedia, we book our hotels through there and it gives you a cash back percentage. And every quarter, I believe it is, they send you a check back. So say, for example, when we book hotels through Expedia, we'll book it through Ebates. And maybe sometimes Ebates is offering 5% cash back. Sometimes it's like 9%. Yeah, it gets high. I'm saying five being modest, but it definitely can be higher. But let's just say it's at that 10% cash back and you book a hotel room for $200. Well, there's 20 bucks right there. There's There's a drink. There's your 10%. (laughs) So we definitely do that as well. And anybody who is booking through Expedia, I highly urge you to use Ebates and register an account for it because even just in general shopping for other everyday items, even non-travel, you will get that cash back via check and you could even apply that cash back towards your travel purchases. An easier way to describe it is basically if you go to Ebates.com, you're going to have a list of every place that you can shop on online and they get credit for referring you to their site. So they're redirecting you to the site and they're sharing the money that they get for referring you. A couple new things about Ebates though, they changed their name to Rakuten, if that's how it's pronounced. You can still go ebates.com and it'll redirect you there. They also have a Google Chrome plugin that when you're on any site, it will pop up just like the honey and you can click to activate. So you actually don't have to go to Ebates first and then go. I've heard of that app through Chrome and I haven't used it yet. Oh, get the Chrome plugin. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely will do. I was just looking on Expedia today for a Miami hotel and it popped up saying activate. Nice. And another last thing to keep in mind, I know I speak for all of us when we say we love Southwest (laughs) just because of the low, low fares that they do have and the snacks. (laughs) Southwest is really, really good at reimbursing you in some sort of way if your ticket fares go down and they always have flash sales. So even though you buy it for cheap, it could be cheaper before your trip. And as a matter of fact, on Chicago coming up here, the prices had gotten lower. I called Southwest and I told the person that I spoke to that I see the 
rates have gone down from the time that I bought it. And they don't give me the credit directly back to me as a cash reimbursement, but on my next purchase through Southwest, you have a confirmation number and you put in that confirmation number when you book and they'll give you the fare difference. So you can also save money on your next flights by looking to see if your prices have gone down on any future flights that you have and get it when it's at the absolute lowest. Great tip. So now we are at Kim's favorite part of the episode. Ooh, question time. Questions of the week. I was going to say, I was waiting for <laughs> your question. Yeah. Questions of the week. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, what questions did we get this week? So, on our Instagram, we got a couple questions, and the first one that we got is, "What travel credit cards do you guys use?" So, what do you guys use? Well, for me, I specifically use my Chase Sapphire Reserve travel credit card, and I absolutely love it. It does have a high annual fee, which I'm not the type of person to like to pay annual fees for cards. However, However, the amount of perks that you get with the card actually pays your fee back. So one thing about the card that I absolutely love is each year they give me a $300 travel credit. So whether I book an airplane ticket, train ticket, even pay for parking in the city, hotel, etc., that counts as travel. So if I spend less than $300, let's just say on an airplane ticket, I buy myself like a $99 Southwest ticket, they'll give me $99 back as a state statement credit up until the point where I hit 300 in travel. So it definitely pays me back. On top of that, it gives me lounge access in the airport. So when Brittany and I travel and have long layovers, we get to go into the lounges, get free drinks, free food. Nice. That definitely saves me money that way as well. And on top of that, the points that we get back just paid in full for our hotel in Dubai when we're staying at Atlantis at the Palm. So that's Ooh. my the Chase Sapphire <laughs> Reserve, like I said, has a expensive annual fee that how much is that it's four hundred and fifty dollars but like i said you get that three hundred dollar statement credit for travel which we always hit so now i'm 150 dollars out of pocket but again in terms of the extra benefits and perks and i just listed a tiny tiny few the 150 is minuscule and i feel like for the amount of travel that we do the lounge access is worth 150 dollars. do they also reimburse you every five years for global entry yes thank you for reminding me of that yeah every five years which is how long your global entry would last for, they reimburse you for that just as well. Yeah, by the way, that's a good travel tip is global entry. That will save you some time and headache right there. Absolutely. Well, well, what about your travel credit card? Because I know you have one that you like to use, Kim. Yeah, I got the Chase card through Southwest and I think I got 60,000 points for signing up, which is several free flights. And then I got five drink tickets, which is awesome. (laughs) Yeah, and I love it. So I get one point for everything I buy and I pretty much put everything on it and then just pay it off and then two points for every Southwest purchase and I fly Southwest all the time so yeah I'm just racking those points up I actually just got a free flight home to Sacramento for Christmas through points well I remember yeah, you, baby. I remember you <laughs> saying you were getting the free flights and a couple of trips I think when you went to New Orleans wasn't it free because you mm-hmm. had the bonus points from the sign up yep. yeah yeah and then I took me and my boyfriend at the time back home for a wedding with points so I've had a lot of free flights very nice. Perfect. Our second question that we got from a listener was, what website do you use to book hotels? I kind of touched on this a little bit beforehand and the things to keep in mind. Like I said, we discussed Ebates. So we definitely use that to then go through Expedia. But sometimes you'll always see some travel sites say cheaper to book direct through them or price match guarantee. So if you see that, then rest assured, book directly through. You know what? I, every hotel will tell you book direct for the best price. And not all of them are being truthful because I always look on the hotel's website, booking.com, Expedia. I look at everything and I always book through whatever is cheaper and it's not always direct. So they're lying sometimes. No, well, I know they are, but I'm <laughs> saying if, if they say it's cheaper because they will do a price match guarantee, True. then book direct versus going through like Expedia. But if it's not, then yeah, absolutely. Some, like Expedia, I'll even call booking. too. Before I push the book button online, I'll call just to see if they give me a better price over the phone. The other site that I love for hotels is Hotels Tonight. And I have a story about this. So when I went up to Seattle, I was reading this blog about Hotel Max in Seattle. It's this boutique hotel. And it was really cute, but the real reason I wanted to stay there is because they have craft beer hour every evening. Sounds delicious. (laughs) 
So it was a boutique hotel, so it was a little bit pricier, but I was watching Expedia and Booking.com and everything else for probably like two months leading up to this trip. And I was also watching Hotels Tonight and I kept seeing the price go down the closer it got to the trip. I ended up booking that hotel the day of for the cheapest price I had seen in the last two months. Wow. Yeah. That's kind of risky And too. then, I know, I know, I was really gambling on that one. But then when I got there with my boyfriend at the time, I told them, they said, why are you in Seattle? And I said, oh, we're celebrating our anniversary and we got upgraded to the suite. Very nice. <laughs> yes. Get it, girl. Yeah, fucking hard. <laughs> <laughs> Not talking about the hotel lady. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any last thoughts about how to plan a trip, how to save money doing it, or how to even save money on your trip? Anything? I think my final thought is to be mindful and plan trips far in advance to give yourself the most time and the best prices. And the most options. And the most options. Just do it. Get over any of the excuses, any of the reasons why you can't. You're the only one holding yourself back. Push through it. Just do it. Start planning. I want to just circle back around to what Brittany said earlier and just reiterate this advice that she gave, which was if you're going to do a trip on your own, look at a travel company's website and actually see what they have listed as the highlights or hotels and things like that and choose that way and see how long they actually have for their tours in those locations as well because that'll be a good frame of reference for you to use in planning your own trip. I think that's a really, really good advice and it definitely came in handy when we were doing Japan, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for tuning in this week and listening to this episode about how to travel, plan a trip, and save money along the way. We hope that you learned tons of tips about how to make it more affordable for you. Please subscribe to our podcast, leave a review, and tune in every Travel Tuesday for new episodes. And if you aren't already, be sure to follow us on Instagram at Travel Squad Podcast. Pack your bags and stay tuned for next week's episode, The Windy City of Chicago. Ooh, Chi-Town. We're talking all about it this episode, too. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.